Well, well, well. What have we here, brave new viewers? I am the controller of this lifeless, godless channel, run by the psychotic, sadistic maniac, Roger Walker. Go now while you can, before the video podcast starts. Before he starts talking horror with Sassy Sledge Hammer. If he finds me warning you, he will kill me. That is, if I'm lucky. What have we become on Slasher Pepper? Hey guys, Slasher Pepper, and welcome to another video. Today is episode four of Talking Horror with, this time with Sassy Sledgehammer. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. You're so welcome. And, um, you know, right off the bat, how, how did you come up with the name? Because I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that. Well, it started out because I was looking for a username on a lot of the different platforms when I, because I initially started cosplaying Nancy Thompson. That was how I got into horror. And that's where I met a lot of the people that I know now. And I was thinking, you know, there's a possibility down the road that I won't be doing just Nancy, even though my whole life was all about Nancy Thompson. And I thought, well, I want to do something that captures the fire that I love about Nancy, but also my personal fire and her weapon of choice, which she only uses for a split second in the movie itself, but it's become pretty synonymous with her, which is her sledgehammer. And so I thought sassy sledgehammer works pretty well. And I really, I'm really glad that people like it. Because <laughs> I was like, does this sound stupid? I don't know. But yeah. That's yeah, it's it's definitely a risky name though you know you never it's <laughs> yeah. it's one of those things where either people love it or or they'll hate it but yeah. i'm glad uh i'm glad to hear that most and people it's really, like it it's it's really hard for people to come up with names i know people have always asked oh yeah me, like i want to do this thing what sh what should i what should my name be i'm like i don't even know i'm really happy that i didn't because i wouldn't know what else to call myself if it weren't for um just just putting that train of thought into it but it was still all about cosplay and me and um something that was a part of nancy but i always tell people whenever you are trying to think of a username think about what you want to do in the future is if, if you're going to be if you're going to have like wonder woman 84 and you just want to do wonder woman cosplay you also have to think about in the future is that all you're going to want to do and would it still represent you if you were to kind of evolve what you put out into the world. Um, and if the answer is yes, then keep marching forward with it. But if it isn't, then you should think about kind of what your goals are and what best represents you and just a name that you'd be happy to be synonymous with. Oh yeah, that's that's a good way to look at it. And uh, you know, I actually took over someone else's um, like way of, of coming up with the name, um, which is basically just combining two things that you love. Um, I don't think he's on Instagram anymore, honestly, but, um, it was like boogie wolf because he loved uh -huh. like the boogeyman and, and like wolves and stuff, uh -huh. like werewolves and, and shit like that. So I was like, you know, I love slasher movies and I love Dr. Pepper. So that's so Pepper. Great. <laughs> I love that. That is great. That's a great, that's a great way to come up with that name. Yeah. I because at first was, oh I was coming up with like crazy shit, like, um, you know, the Dr. Pepper vault or some some stupid stuff like that on was like you know it's too long you know it should it should just be like either two or three words you know and yeah so slasher pepper it is <laughs> yeah it rolls right off the tongue yeah so it's obvious that a nightmare on elm street well it's safe to assume that a nightmare on elm street is your favorite franchise of like the maybe <laughs> <laughs> right so how did that kind of start how did you you know get into that franchise um I didn't grow up liking, well, I didn't grow up with horror. My family was pretty conservative. We'd watch it every so often, but I was always afraid of everything in the horror world. And um, my birthday's in October. So I always kind of was interested in the macabre and the dark, even though I was very scared. I was too scared to watch most horror, but I'd seen the Universal Monsters. 
I like to have Halloween themed birthday parties. I would read the R.L. Stein books. Um, so it was just, I guess, a gradual process, but I never really watched the movies all the way through. I, of course, a lot of people have seen Nightmare on Elm Street, maybe on TV or somewhere in passing, or they've seen Freddy and Spirit Halloween or a Halloween store or some somewhere. And I, so I was on vacation with my family and I had a dream that Freddie was after me and I don't know what it was about the dream if it was because it seemed pretty realistic but I woke up and was like that was so random I kind of really want to learn more about Freddy Krueger and that was my thought process and so I just went home and I rented uh Freddy's Dead and then I started watching all the movies in just random order wow and that's how that and that's how that got started and then I fell in love with Nancy Thompson because I had um like her length brown poofy hair and since I watched Freddy's Dead, I knew that it took place in Ohio, even though the earlier films obviously have palm trees and it's clear that it's California. Um, so I just always still associate it with Ohio, which is where I'm from. And so it just, I felt a lot of connection to Nancy, which is what kickstarted my cosplay. And I just love the whole franchise because I, I love the idea of dreams. I love that every film touches on different, a lot of symbolism, different aspects of the teen experience. I love the characters. I think that they are not a cut and paste. They all have something unique about them. Like Sheila's a nerd and Debbie is kind of a, kind of a metal looking edgy fashion um, girl who likes dynasty and working out. And I, I just feel like everything is so unique about the kids. And I, I love the overall story. And I love the idea of the underbelly of suburbia. Everybody thinks they're so perfect. Everybody wants to have this beautiful little house, but really underneath it's, there's something dark there. And that has all, that concept has always really intrigued me because um, uh, growing up in suburbia, everybody just always tried to be so good, but you knew that they were not as perfect as they tried to make themselves out to seem. So I always loved it when films, including American Beauty would kind of jab at that it always brought me great pleasure. <laughs> yeah, sounds awesome. Yeah, I, I so I would always, um, I always kind of preferred part two over part three. Is that you know what? I love hearing that because in my mind, that is the scariest of all the films. I know not everybody right? agrees, but Freddy's the most sinister. The music is creepy. It's very dark. It's a it's a great movie, and it's really underappreciated. And I know a lot of people say, "Hey, it is." Uh, it doesn't follow the rules, but we're talking about the second film. When that film came out, you just had one film and there wasn't really much there to work with. You could just right. make your own rules as you go along. And uh, it was just that the, the films after part two ignored it, which is such a shame because I think it would have been nice to bring Jesse back into it because we don't really know what happened to him because he did survive. As far as we know, even though they were on the bus, I mean, who knows if that was a dream or, or what happened. Um, I'm assuming so, because you don't just have Freddy bursting through people's chests. <laughs> but, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, but I would love, I would have loved to have seen it come back in, but it is, it's so underrated and it's, it's great. Did you see Mark Patton's documentary? I did not. It's, it's like on Shutter, right? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. I, so in, in Holland, um, we, we don't have Shutter yet, or at least it's not oh, available darn. yet. So, you know, I can't really see it now. Yeah. But who knows? Hopefully one day I will get to see it because I've been hearing hearing just great things about it. Yeah, yeah. And I I also saw on your Instagram that you um, read the the Nine Man Elm Street book, Suffer the Children. Yeah. What do you think yeah. of that one? Um. Well, I read it a while ago, and I haven't read it since. But I wanna <laughs> I wanna reread it. I just. I haven't gotten to it. Um, oh, right. <laughs> I'm trying to finish another book, but I really enjoy all of those stories because just having more Elm Street content. And I really look to the books a lot for, I, I really actually enjoy the adaptation, the, the movie adaptation that were turned into books. So like New Nightmare, which is my favorite out of all the films. Oh, that one, that one is, that, that book um, yeah. is just so amazing because it's like, the writer wrote himself like uh -huh. into that story, you know, which yeah. I just thought was so creative. And I, and I actually interviewed him, uh, interviewed that author. Like that was my first interview. That was, that was what got me into it. But I just thought it was so creative, you know, because yeah. usually novelizations tend to be, you know, the movie and book form. 
but yeah. sometimes they'll add just so much to it that it's really worth your time yeah. and, and reading. What did you think about, um, have you read either the first script that Wes wrote with Bruce Wagner for part three or the novelization of part three and how different it is? What'd you think about that? It, it was so different. It was, I, I mean, I think I definitely prefer the movie, you know, that we got, but it's extremely interesting just to read, you know, the different, uh, different story and like the first draft really, you know, yeah. um, it's wild, but it's been a it? long time since yeah. I read it. Did you, uh, and, and this is one thing that I really loved about the original variation of part three was that they, because it seemed to me, I know I can't change the movies and they are what they are and I can't argue even though I have a preference. Um, <laughs> but you know, at the end of part one, Nancy knows that Freddie's not gone. And then at the end of the part three movie, she's like, oh yeah, he's gone, it's over. It's like, what, what are you talking about? Did you unlearn that? How? <laughs> How did you give up so easily? But I love it in the novelization and in the script where she's like, oh yeah, no, it's over. And then she's like, I oh, know you're Freddy. And he's like, oh no. And then they go at it. Um, and then she lives on in the beautiful dream, which I think is so great because they also incorporated that into the innovation comics. And so she just becomes more than just dead. She's now the good equivalent to Freddy. Um, and I really wish they would have kept that in there because I think there could have been a lot of potential for that. But I, I think they probably just wanted to kill everybody off. Um, and it, it seems that way. They just wanted to kill everybody off who was in the previous films and just kind of move on. Right. But it would have just been a great part of the story. And I'm glad they kept it in the comics uh, because that was really great when she got to meet Alice and they all got to kind of fight with the dream warriors. And so I really enjoyed that. Yeah, quite honestly, I, I, I don't really remember that. Like it, it starts to ring a bell now that you mention it, but uh, I think I mostly just forgot about that. It's It's been a long time since I've read it yeah. to begin with. So Yeah, I know. There's just a bunch of stuff. Like I, I know that I've read a bunch of the Nightmare books and that's why I wanted to reread them is because I don't remember a whole lot about <laughs> what I read before. I remember little bits and pieces, but that's it. Yeah, and, um, my favorite always has been... Uh, the second one from like the Black Flame series, uh, Dream Spawn. I think yeah. that's that one is just like the first 150 pages, Freddy doesn't even show up. Mm -hmm. But in a slasher film, usually it's like you only care about either a main character or you care about nobody, usually. Yeah. Um, but with that book, you just cared about every single character because, you know, the first 150 pages were just centered around them. Mm hmm. Do you think that that's, do you like it better when um, movies make you care about the characters or when you, they just kind of kill them off? I mean, what, what are your, what are your thoughts about that um, element of storytelling and slashers? For me, it really doesn't matter. I enjoy both, you know, but um, uh, I really enjoyed it in this book because it really stood out because of that. But if there's a fun story and, um, you know, it has good kills and good killer, a good score, good directing and stuff. That's what I mostly care about. Um, but if the characters are great too, then then that's that's just the thing added to it that is just you know really fun. Um, yeah. How do you look at that? I um, I think you, you're right. It depends on the story because sometimes um, if it's just trying to be fun and wild and out there and everybody is kind of over the top and that's the point of the story that it makes sense but like I said the one of the reasons I love Nightmare is because I feel like I, I usually care for a lot of the characters and they're pretty dynamic um Alice even though I love Nancy has the best character arc I mean she just goes from this mousy girl to this total badass and then on to be a mom and so um it really does depend on the story um but I'm always curious because I know that I've heard people before say that they just, you know, they, they, they love the slasher themselves more than the character. And that's something that being a final girl fan, even though I do love Freddie, um, that it's really interesting to always hear people's perspectives. Cause a lot of people just, they just prefer the killer all the time. And so I'm always curious what people think, especially yeah, given a, a, a slasher fan. Yeah, yeah, but it's so interesting because usually it really depends on the movie and, and what is going on because mm -hmm. with some movies you can still care about the characters, but then again, 
you're kind of also rooting for the killer and you kind of just don't know who to root for anymore. <laughs> Yesterday I was watching like uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, the, the beginning um, for the first time. And it was just like, you know, I was kind of on one, on one hand, I was really rooting for, you know, the, the main characters, but then like the killers and the fucked up family is so much fun too. And just so crazy and out there that you're also kind of rooting for them, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you, um, what did you think about Freddy versus Jason? I feel like that's one where they really didn't care that much about the characters, where the characters just became kind of oh yeah uh, disposable, but then you were rooting for the killers. But I actually found myself rooting for one over the other, which is I think how they set up the story. Did you have one of the two, either Freddy or Jason, you were rooting more for? Um... You know, it's been a, it's been a long time since I first watched it. I watched it, I rewatched it recently, but um, you know, I don't really think I, I'm I'm really on on one side in that. I just really enjoy seeing them fight. Uh, yeah. But I definitely think that's just one of those interesting things because I remember just at the time when Civil War came out, I was I was still pretty young, and um, you know, at the time I was I was just it was just crazy because everyone was like, Oh, team Captain America or team Iron Man, you know? And that was, was that going on when Freddy versus Jason was released? Was that were like fans being, you know, on team Jason or team Freddy? It's uh, yeah, it's, it's still going on. I mean, even though I love yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street, when I watched the movie and I know this is what made a lot of Jason fans mad was that they made Jason more, uh, you felt a lot more sympathy toward him and he did kind of, come to be the victim out of the two so i found myself rooting for jason even though i still wanted freddie to win i just felt really bad for jason um but but yeah i know a lot of people are still saying team jason team freddie and even back then i remember watching special features on the dvds which i wish they would do this again and i don't know if they have this anywhere but it would be like a like a camp hack and slash where you go and you watch like friday the 13th movies or um, sleepaway camp at a camp and then it's just an adult camp where you do camping things like the kids do in the movies but it's also like a horror thing and they had one of those for the premiere of freddy versus jason and everybody was either making a paper glove or a, a hockey mask and uh it just seems like like so much fun it just seems like so much fun i would i wish that that was a thing but yeah people people still pick Team Freddy, Team Jason. I'm yeah, for me, Team Freddy. <laughs> I, I I definitely prefer the Friday the Thirteenth movies, um, mm -hmm. because I I just uh, love like the the variety of movies you have in there. Like some are, you know, pretty serious, and then some are like just really out there. Like Jason goes to that or Jason X, you know. Um, but I just enjoy all of them for different reasons. Um, Whereas a Nightmare on Elm Street, I think, is more consistent in terms of quality, um, except for the remake because that one is just that one sucks. <laughs> um, but uh, I definitely prefer Freddy as a character, though. So it, for me, it's not like I'm all out Friday the Thirteenth fan and mm -hmm. prefer Jason as a character too, because I actually think Freddy is more of an interesting character and you know really unique, honestly. What's your favorite Friday the Thirteenth film? Uh, I gotta go with six. Jason lives. I What's think yours? that might be mine too. That yeah. might be mine too. Even though I really do have a soft spot for Jason Goes to Hell. Oh, me I think too. It's may maybe because I, uh, I think I've watched it the most, but I really like it. Who's your favorite um, female character in the Friday the Thirteenth franchise? Ah, uh, that's that's so hard, and and I don't even remember all of the names, but um. Yeah, I, I really couldn't answer that one. What's your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Yeah, it's Ginny from part two. Yeah, that one is really good. That was, that's one that come, definitely comes to mind instantly. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. she's just iconic too. Yeah, a lot of people really like Chris from part three. And I think the reason that I, I really remember these names a lot is because a lot of my friends and I have talked about who we really like. And not a lot of people that I know pick Ginny. So every time someone on Twitter goes, yeah, Ginny's my favorite. I'm like, yeah, Ginny. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, uh, everybody always picks Chris, but I have no idea why, because I just feel like Ginny has a lot more attitude. She's got a lot of smarts and, um, it just when she puts on that sweater and pretends to be Pamela, I love that about her. So 
yeah, she's, she's a pretty great character, but I was curious. Um, I always love talking to everybody else and I actually have a question for you. Um, do you think, so I know that I said with the Nightmare on Elm Street's characters that to me, the way that the stories come across, it makes you feel like you care about them more and they are pretty different. But I wonder if that's somewhat a bias of being so invested in the films and, and the material and just being a huge Nightmare on Elm Street fan. I mean, do you think that that is pretty true for a Nightmare on Elm Street? Or do you think when it comes to like, Halloween and Friday the 13th and some of the other slasher franchises that they also have some pretty dynamic characters or do you think perhaps A Nightmare on Elm Street does have that even a little more? I definitely think A Nightmare on Elm Street has that a little more um, because you know I think uh, what's the name like Tommy Jarvis he's, mm -hmm. he's like the one in part four five and six but um, you know it's a different act actor anytime. So I think that one mm -hmm. character had a lot of potential, but because it's just a different actor every single time, it kind of already loses that dynamic that way, you know? Um, and I know like, wasn't it in part four and five that they changed actors for? Oh, uh, three and four for Kristen. They right. Was, and uh, Patricia Arquette and then Tuesday night. A die art fan here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but I think um, with that one, is it's different because at least in part five, she returned, right? That's right. It was four. It went from three to four. Yeah. Yeah, but then she returned. Oh, uh, the one oh you're talking Alice. Alice returned. Well, they changed actors for, um, for Kristen between three and four, but Alice, who's Lisa Wilcox, she was still in four and five. So they pretty much kept everybody the same except Kristen. Yeah, right. And and then, you know, Heather, she returns in one and, and three. And of course, she's also a new nightmare. Um, and, you know, Freddy Krueger, just overall, all the characters usually kind of return, you know, and, and with the original actor. So, which doesn't really happen in the other movies, because there they change a lot. And, and I'm announced it also has just one timeline. Um, and it's also kind of a clear timeline. It's not like it could be anywhere. It's it's really, you know, this happens first and part two next and three next. Mm -hmm. No prequels or anything. So I think that already just helps a lot with characters. So I definitely, even though Friday the 13th is my favorite franchise, and I'm going to definitely has the best characters. Yeah, that's, I, I always, I always like asking those questions because sometimes I never know if it's just my bias or... Yeah. <laughs> You know, other fans, because my boyfriend, his favorite is his favorite are the Friday the 13th movies. He loves Jason Voorhees so much. And um, so I always try to have these conversations with him. And sometimes we'd be like, hmm. And so, <laughs> like, okay, well, I guess I'll just ask other people. All right. <laughs> um, so how did you get into horror? How long have you been a oh, fan? Did you grow up with it? Uh, no, not really, actually. And, and my parents and, and like brother and uh, everyone, like my whole family doesn't even really like horror that much. I just think I'm a psycho. Um, but I, I think it mostly just started like the second I watched, so really surprisingly, the Spider-Man movie, like the 2002 oh, one um, by yeah. Sam Raimi. I just remember when I was like six years old and going to a friend's house. And have you seen the 2002 one? Mm -hmm. When that yeah. glider hits Willem Dafoe, you know, and like oh, yeah. you can kind of see blood coming out of his mouth. That, mm -hmm. As a kid, that was like, holy shit, that's creepy, but also really cool, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just remember seeing that movie every single time I visited that friend. And um, I also watched Raiders of the Lost Ark and with like the ghosts and like the melting faces. And I thought uh -huh. it was so cool. Just from that second, I just fell in love with, with movies and films. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a big Marvel fan. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Civil War was, mm -hmm. you know, I was really into that Marvel Cinematic Universe thing and all. And then later, I kind of got into, I wanted to watch all Marvel movies, just all of them, you know, also the 80s ones and like the early mm -hmm. 2000 ones. So I watched like The Punisher with Thomas Jane and um, 
you know, the Punisher War Zone, uh, Ghost Rider with, with Nicolas Cage. I love Ghost Rider. <laughs> I love Ghost Rider. I made my boyfriend watch it, but like that is my family loves Ghost Rider. It's so such I a love Ghost Rider. fun film. Yes. <laughs> are you are you referring to the 2007 one or uh, or Spirit of Vengeance? Both of them. Yeah, but both are really the fun. First, even though the first one I just really love. I love the first one the most, but they're both. They're both so much fun, and I just love how crazy it is, and I love Nicolas Cage. I, I, I love all of his films, and I know he's super popular now, but I, I, he's just so fun in those movies. <laughs> I mean, he's turning, and he's like, ah, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, he's <laughs> just, just overacting. It just makes my day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I kind of started watching, you know, like the more violent and, and maybe a bit scarier um, Marvel movies. And eventually I start, started really getting into like 80s movies, um, you know, just like um, teen movies and stuff like that, Back to the Future or whatever. Mm -hmm. And eventually I, I watched this YouTuber and he was talking about Darkman being like one of his favorite movies. Uh, and I watched it and I was like, you know, this, this music and like the title sequence really gives me a vibe of, of like watching Spider-Man for the first time. And I just, it really like clicked or something. So later I found out it was directed by Sam Raimi. Um, and then I really got into Sam Raimi movies and, you know, The Evil Dead and, and Drag Me to Hell. And I just loved it. And really, that's kind of how it all started. I couldn't mention that's like awesome. a bunch of other titles, <laughs> but yeah. those are the main ones that like played a big role into like, you know, kind of like an evolution going on from Marvel to horror. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that 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 totally makes sense going from superhero movies because I also love superhero movies. I have seen every time Marvel would come out with something, I'd try to see it as soon as possible. So oh, I yeah. always love those. I think I saw Avengers when it came out maybe maybe six times in theaters. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Um, but uh, the the Dark Knight is still the film that I've seen the most, even though that's DC. I think I maybe saw that eight times. But yeah, I just love seeing those on on the on the screen. And I know some people will be like, oh, you know, that's so it's like popcorn movie, but they're all of those superhero movies are just they're just a blast. I mean you go in and you just have so much fun. There's action and I it always makes me tear up whenever I watch the audience reactions from like um, Infinity War uh, or an Endgame. Oh my God, that one, an Endgame. When everybody comes out, man, it gets me every time. It gets me every time. <laughs> right. So much. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that seems like a natural evolution. And, and you like Drag Me to Hell. Because I know not everybody does, but I love Drag Me I like Drag Me I to Hell. I love it too. Yeah. It's I just feel like... Um... The jump scares are a bit overdone, though. Mm -hmm. Like they even do a jump scare for, um, like, what do you call it? Like, uh, uh, you know, what you use to um, <laughs> when you have like a cold and you need to, you know, do something with your nose and you have like oh, this yeah, towel. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're talking about. And and they even jump scare that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it's not really creepy, but it's just an anno annoying, so loud sound, you know? Yeah. So do you, um, do you like the, like Evil Dead when it was more serious, like the first film or second Army of Darkness? Do you prefer well, it when it's scarier or a little bit sillier? I, I, I watched Army of Darkness really when I was getting into horror, honestly. Uh, and I didn't watch it since because I didn't like it at first, uh, which now it seems like it, it'd be just the perfect movie for me, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, but Evil Dead 2, I really liked, and that's still my favorite. And I watched like season one, I think, of Ash vs. Evil Dead, and I, I thought that was a blast too. Um, yeah, I love that. I love uh, But the, the Evil Dead, you know, the actual yeah. first one, it's kind of, um, you know, it's fun and it's good. But now it's kind of a cliche, you know, uh, yeah. but you got to step into the time zone and, and just realize that that was like the first time someone had done like a cabin in the woods sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, really with like the formula <laughs> we have nowadays. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Do you prefer the like the really funny ones or the more serious ones? I um, I'm more on the fun side fun funny side of things i really do like army of darkness 
Um, but I, my favorite mix of everything because I felt like it was dark. It had some serious moments. It wasn't too over the top was, would be um, Ash versus the Evil Dead. I mean, I just love how they put all that together. Um, I, I really enjoyed the heck out of that show. Really enjoyed the heck out of it. I love how they executed it. So for me, I think they did the best job, at least for my preference um, with the TV show. But yeah, I'm, I'm more on the, the funny side. Yeah, me too, for sure. And, um, you know, another question. Do you have a, an absolute, like, number one favorite movie? Um, I do. And it is, are we talking about just horror or in, like, overall? Just overall in this case. Okay. Oh, wait, are, like, make movies, are we still in the Evil Dead verse? No, no, like of all times, okay. any movie. <laughs> My favorite movie of all time, just because it has a nostalgia factor for me, is the 2004 version of The Phantom of the Opera, uh, which I saw in theaters. I was very scared at first because I didn't really know much about it. And I was like, Grandma, because my grandma took me, Grandma, is it going to be scary? Because I know it's a phantom in an opera. And she was like, no, I don't think so. And um, and then I remember one scene where there was like a fake prop head, like obviously a fake head, um, not even supposed to be a real person, just like a stage prop. And I was like, oh my gosh, but I love it. The movie has so many problems with it, but it's beautifully shot. I love the actors in it. So it always sticks with me. I saw Patrick Wilson last year when I was in, um, and he plays Raoul in it. Um, and of course he's done a lot of horror movies and I was standing next to him because I was going to meet Carlo Gugino and I wanted to meet him so bad because I love Phantom so much. And I was just kind of looking at him like, oh my God, it's Raoul, oh my God, it's Raoul. <laughs> um, but then also just behind it is Wes Craven's New Nightmare. I love Wes Craven's New Nightmare. I can talk about it all the time. Um, it's so good. Yeah. It is so good and not a lot of people like it and a lot of times when I've asked people why they don't they'll say because you know it's not the same Freddy but that was the point of it was you know he was in the real world and they wanted to make him look different and even Robert has talked about when he was going to step back into the role he just kind of assumed that silly Freddy that we see in the beginning of the movie and Wes was like no 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 go dark but also kind of reinvent it so then Robert had to put his fedora on and uh, just think about he wanted how he wanted to approach it. And I, I just love the, the, how they brought in fairy tales. I love how they, I love the acting and the execution and how you don't see the title till the end. And it, it, the commentary about the impact of, of movies on people and especially people who have made the movies and something like Freddy Krueger. I mean, did we do a good thing at making this, serial killer so popular or is it negative I, I just I just love all of that because that's one of the reasons why I love Wes Craven so much is because he puts so much thought into it and I'm a deep thinker and I always really liked analyzing movies which is another reason why I really love horror is because everybody just there's so much symbolism and so so much to pick apart that everybody just goes hard and you're like oh oh and when I tell people that I'm a horror fan and they ask why um I usually give them the spiel about A Nightmare on Elm Street, but then I also talk about that there's so much psychology and storytelling and symbolism and metaphors for human nature and that they're very reflective of the times that we live in. They're always like, huh, which, you know, because people don't expect that. They're just like, oh, they're just stupid movies with X, Y, and Z and Final Girl and someone's dumb and they're going out the front door. I mean, basically everything that Scream calls out um, but there really is so much more to the genre and the community is filled with so many amazing people. I'm oh, yeah. so surprised. I mean, I really have learned a lot, especially with everybody on Instagram. Um, I've really learned a lot of, about movies that I should check out. Um, because when everybody shows their VHS tapes and whatnot, and when they talk about the things that they like, it's opened a lot of doors for me to things that I haven't seen because there's so much out there. Sometimes it's really overwhelming. But um, but when you look at everything that you've watched as a horror fan, I mean, just like I watched Blood Diner not that long ago because um, <laughs> Gabby, Gabby posted about it. She was like, I love Blood Diner. And I was like, well, I, 
I'm gonna have to check out Blood Diner, and I loved it. And it's just so wild, but it was yeah. a blast. And I, I really, um, I know there's a there's a strong community on Twitter for horror movies, but really there is two on Instagram, and people just have such amazing, beautiful collections and their T-shirts, and everybody's doing cosplay now and recreating covers and people are so creative in this community i love the heck out of this community i never i'm so glad that i'm a horror fan i'm so happy that i'm in this community because everybody's just so smart and i mean how, how long have you been doing podcasting um you know i, I did my first interview in like 2018 mm -hmm. and um or no 2019 actually like march mm -hmm. uh and then i you know did an interview in april this year and and ever since i've i've done like I think 30 interviews now, uh, total. Uh, but I started really doing YouTube like years ago already. I started doing Lego stop motion movies. Um, well, that's cool. you know, on a whole different channel. But then I think in like mid 2018, I started really focusing on horror and basically I just copied drum dumps because I was a fan of him. Um, but then through that, I found my own style and in, in like horror, video making on YouTube basically. And, and now I, I have come up with like my own shows, you know, yeah. <laughs> instead of just reviewing movies because yeah. it's been on so many times, you know? Yeah. So, um, what, what made you want to interview a lot of people in the community? Um, like Gabby, what, what kind of drew you into just seeing people around and being like, you know what, I kind of want to just talk to them. Cause I know a lot of people really talk to the celebrities but i always love watching interviews with people in the community well f first up um you know usually it gets a lot of viewers so mm -hmm. got to be honest with that you know um and second up uh it's just a great community on instagram uh and i think on instagram you can post like a 10 minute igtv video and you kind of get to know people through that, maybe if people even watch. But on Instagram, everything is like, you know, really fast. You see a post, you like it, and maybe you comment on it, and then you scroll further, you know. Uh, but in like a video like this, if, you know, after like 30 minutes of watching me talk to like Gabby, um, mm -hmm. you get to know her, you know, yeah. like you actually know who it is. And then when you see her photos again, uh, after a little while, you know, oh, you know, it's, that was her favorite movie. That's interesting. And now she's posting about it, you know, so you actually get to know the people on Instagram that usually are just like a still image holding like a, a, a videotape or something. Now you can actually see them move and talk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so that was basically kind of what started it. And, you know, it's been so much fun too, because um, the only people that have been on the show, I was actually, I'm actually like a fan of their page. So uh, it's, it's just fun to see and get to talk to those people. That's awesome. Including That's awesome. you, of course. I'm really, I'm really honored. I know that um, I told you that um, in the very beginning before we started recording that I have a podcast about people in the community just doing things. Like one of, one of my favorite things about the community, and I'm curious to also hear your thoughts. I, I love fan-made stuff and fan-driven stuff that, because um, like I love fan films. Um, I'm a huge every time a fan film comes out, I'm like, I got to watch it. I got to check this out because they always have people put so much thought into these concepts and it could be over time and whatnot, but they know these characters, they know these movies and they're just doing it out of love. And some are great, some are not, but I always love watching that passion. And that's what drove me to do my podcast that I started at the very beginning of this year and then when everything happened I was kind of like Meh, and it went away a little bit and so I'm picking it back up again but the horrorpreneur which is just you know people going I want to do uh you know I want to do a podcast and then they get so far and they, you know, they they learn stuff like you've you've had to have started out knowing you know what you wanted to do and like you said you found your voice and how you got there how you came up with your name you know how you prepare for interviews, things that somebody's like, you know, I want to start a podcast. I want to start a horror podcast. What do I need to know about this from somebody who's, who's done it, who's a lot like me. And just um, the person who actually s s sparked my interest in that was Casey, the homicidal homemaker. Just this wild idea of somebody who is great, is a fantastic baker and crafter. And 
she's just done all this horror stuff. Like, how did you decide to go here? Did you love horror? How did you learn to make this? Do you fail a lot? And then you have your show um, with this great set. I mean, you know, are they, are they friends? Are they, um, you know, do you pay them? How often do you do it? How long does it take? Just a lot of those questions because, and a lot of it's just me genuinely being curious. Like if I wanted to do this, what would I have to do? You know? Um, so I just think that that's, that's great. And I, I love that you are interviewing people in the community because um, there's so much that goes into this community that is outside of the movies or the TV shows that even though those are great to hear, you get a lot of interviews from them. Um, but yeah, I, I love, I love talking to everybody in the community. So it's really cool that you're doing that. Yeah, it's, it's been a great experience so far. And, you know, it's, uh, it is a great community and it's a big community now too. So yeah. there's lots of accounts to choose from. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I did a lot of interviews with like um, horror directors or actors and stuff, but I thought, you know, maybe it's fun to, you know, get to know the community itself a little bit because who knows, maybe I or the person I'm, I'm talking to will learn something from it. You know, it's it, yeah. only good things can come from it really. Yeah. So what have you, what have you learned since, you know, starting to, to interview people? I know you said you found your voice. How did you kind of get there? And what, how has your perception of doing something like this changed? Like, did you start out with this equipment or were you like, you know what, it would sound better if I invested in it or. Oh yeah. No, basically, um, you know, do you want, do you want to go really way back to. Yeah. To I like, mean, yeah. let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> so I, I started off doing, um, you know, Lego stop motion videos, like in, in, well, I, I don't know how to say it is in, in, in like the American school system or, or wherever you're from, whoever is watching. Um, but here it's like the eighth group. And I think you're, you must be like 13, 14 years old, probably, okay. yeah. if not younger, probably 12. Um, mm -hmm. and then I already started doing like Lego stop motion movies. And posting them on YouTube, you know, and I just love doing that. And, um, you know, then I did like, a, I think I, at the time I did like a, a news video basically about like the Lego movie too. And I really enjoyed doing that. And I was like, you know, I, maybe I can do this, but with Marvel news. And I did that for like two videos. And I was like, I don't really like this, but I love Marvel. So let's continue making Marvel <laughs> videos. And I, and I made some really lame shit. And if I look at it now, I'm like, oh my God, I, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, but uh, I did learn a lot from it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, basically the Marvel channel kind of was like skits and stuff and movie reviews, book reviews maybe. And then I started a Spider-Man trilogy um, uh, YouTube channel which um, is still this channel, by the way, but just the name has changed and everything's changed. And I think all the old videos are gone, at least most of them, I hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I started doing Spider-Man YouTube poops. Now, I don't know if you're familiar oh gosh, with- the YouTube poops. <laughs> I remember the poops. Yes, yes, I remember those. So I started doing those kind of videos. But I think the combination of doing like stop motion videos Mm -hmm. um, skits and you know eventually YouTube poops just really helped like form this channel mm -hmm. and I, I really started liking horror so I basically did like the the basic stuff that everyone really starts out with which is just like mm -hmm. ranking the Chucky series ranking the Freddy <laughs> series and it's, it's just mm -hmm. been done so many times now like um, no that's my advice to new YouTubers um, just completely random and thrown in there, but I, I just need to give this advice to new or people that want to get into uh, like making YouTube videos. Come up with something original um, mm -hmm. because, you know, you need to be, nobody just wants another drum dumps, you know, which was my mistake really because <laughs> I started making drum dump type videos. Um, but it's, it's, you know, start with your own series. I mean, it can be like really crazy. People will enjoy it. If, if you, if you really think like, you know, this could be something, then you should just go out and do it because there will be people that enjoy it. Uh, I have a show, uh, where I do drinking games with Dr. Pepper. Um, but th 
through doing those like Dr. Pepper drinking guests, I mean, you don't get drunk, so it's not crazy because mm -hmm. of that. Um, but it's still just a lot of fun because, you know, the soda kind of makes you hyped up. And yeah. also <laughs> the jokes are just, you know, we make a lot of jokes throughout the movie and that's mostly what it's about. Like it could, might as well, you might as well remove the Dr. Pepper and all the rules and like the competitive drinking game stuff. Um, and then it was, it would just be a movie reaction basically. And just having fun watching that movie. Um, but it is a really original show, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that's my advice basically to new people wanting to make a YouTube channel. I think that's like the best advice I, I could possibly give. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, then I, then I really started to find my own voice and my own, you know, sort of, sort of content and this, uh, you know, what I really like doing myself. So here we are now talking to you. <laughs> yeah. It's, I always love uh, finding out journeys because everybody always figures out what they end up wanting to do and they start down one path and they go, eh, it doesn't feel right. And then they go down this path, they go, eh, maybe not. Because, um, yeah, and, and it's totally okay, you know, to go through those phases and be like, ah, I think I want to try this, but it's not really doing it for me. So so you've come into your own and you're 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 pretty happy with everything you've chose, right? Like you think, oh, I see the journey and... I see how I got here and it, it makes sense for me. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, now I, like recently I started a new cooking show. Um, I had, I've only one episode so far, but I made like a Jason burger and it was basically the one from Jason goes to hell, you know? Yeah. Um, and it kind of my own spin on it. And, and I was like, you know, this, this could really be something because no one has done it. Yeah. Um, well, I, I found out later that you have the homicidal home baker, which is just like it's kind of similar, but it's it's you know it's different enough because you can mm -hmm. you can come up with a new movie review thing. You can come up with something that everyone is going to be doing after you do yeah. it for the first time. You know? Yeah, and one of the and I don't know if you've uh, if you've talked to her or you've thought about it, but Lovely Zena, aka the Real Queen of Horror on Twitter. Um, she also has a YouTube show. One of the things I love about her is just her approach. Um, because yes, people have a lot of similarities, but the one thing that I really love about her is she will talk about the different movies, but she'll pick up like, like the top five snitches in horror. And you're like, well, that's so random or the top five most annoying zombies. And you're like, okay, I want to find this out <laughs> because she knows so much and they're so creative that, you know, it's not just, talking about this, talking about that, and not saying that anybody who does it, because everybody has their own flavor, but definitely when you get those topics, that it is different, because I know with my A Nightmare on Elm Street channel, it's just all A Nightmare on Elm Street, and then there's the Friday the 13th network, and they just talk about Friday the 13th, but it is so unique, and so you get that niche, and that's why people follow you, and I think that that's been one of the things for me, because I do like uh, the superhero movies. I do like the show Once Upon a Time that was on for a while and, and Disney, which a lot of horror fans actually really also enjoy Disney. We are very much good, good. And then like, you know, blood and guts over here. But <laughs> Disney can be pretty scary. Um, and fairy tales were kind of the first horror lessons that we ever had. Uh, and uh, so just kind of when you start out because I was so Nancy Thompson and I'm glad that my name wasn't Nancy Thompson X, Y, and Z because then it evolved and now Sassy Sledgehammer is just, um, could, could be anything. Um, and it, it's, even though I do have a lot of A Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, I, I try to introduce things every so often. Like I do a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. And my TikTok, I wanted to do horror and it didn't do as well. But then when I started cosplaying Regina from Once Upon a Time, it was like, Phew! everybody loved it. And so then those people started to come to my Instagram and they're like, maybe make a Regina Instagram. And I'm like, I don't know, that's like <laughs> a lot to do. So, but, but, you know, I'm always worried if I give them more of this, then will the horror fans pull away? Because horror really is my heart and soul. And, um, when you talk about doing a channel or something, you, you have that, that niche that, you know, you're known for and that makes you different. And that pretty much is why people follow you. And then the more they get to know you, the more they'll love anything you do, but they still kind of have that interest. So if I started doing like, Oh, I don't know if I did switch to Disney, 
not everybody wants to see that. I mean, they did follow for horror, you know what I mean? So yeah. um, that is one thing that when you think about your name and you think about where you're going um, and everybody wants to be genuine and people pretty much are genuine, but you still have that niche that you kind of have to follow along with. Uh, if you want to continue to be a creator and be pretty successful at it online, whether it be your YouTube show, your podcast, um, just just your general personality, um, you, you kind of have to have that in mind with everything you do because you could still be genuine, um, but you do have to put a little bit more strategy behind it. So it's very... Wow, my brain is like, <laughs> I said, I went like this, but it basically all boils down to, you know, finding your voice and figuring out yeah. what you want to do and um, sticking with it. You know, have you found a lot of success? Just, um, is, do you think it's pretty hard to, do you, would you describe yourself as like mostly pop culture in a way with like a little bit of horror, a little bit more horror? Cause I know that you have a lot of interest that you do. Um, so do you feel like it's hard to keep up with all of that? Or have you found your happy, like mix of everything that you, you have with your horror and some of the other stuff as well? Well, you know, at the moment I'm just really focused on horror, but, um, mm -hmm. I definitely think it's, it's like an interesting thing because it's so hard to get like really big success in, in, you know, such a small genre really. Uh, you know, so, um, but yeah, I think that's, um, that's a whole different story, but, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's just hard because horror is such a small genre, especially like eighties horror and, and people that are really dedicated to it. It's like, mm -hmm. it's a big community and it's like my world. Mm -hmm. But really when I start to look around, there's no one in real life that I really know that loves yeah. horror as much as I do. And I'm like, but on Instagram, it seems like it's just the whole uh -huh. world loves horror, you know? <laughs> yeah, it is so crazy. And um, yeah, I, and I know what that feels like. I mean, growing up when I didn't have, when the internet was still kind of new-ish and I was just getting into horror, like nobody talked about Nancy Thompson. And that's why I was like, Nancy Thompson must be in the world again. I mean, everybody <laughs> must talk about her. Um but yeah, because I, growing up, I never knew anybody who liked horror. And then when I went to horror conventions, which I'm lucky to be in the Midwest because we have quite a few here, then you start to meet people and they're like an hour away and they love horror. And you're like, well, now that we've met, because we've had this event where we can all get together, now we see where we are. But most of the time I just kind of derp around and think, you know, there aren't a whole lot of horror fans around here other than myself. Um, and I know that in the United States, we have a lot, I don't know if you have any of those kind of events over in, in where you are. Where Closest you thing to me like is, that. um, is Germany. Yeah. But that, you, that, have you thought about doing something in your local community where you try to have maybe like a horror trivia night or some kind of movie? I, I really haven't, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> cause I was just curious. Cause I know that, um that that's I know that um where I live that's how I've met some people around here is someone decided to be like hey uh in our city you know this is going to be a group of horror people and there aren't like a lot but it's been it's been a great opportunity to meet new people for me um and I know like I said uh in America we have some we have a lot of conventions and especially in the Midwest I know sometimes the West Coast they have like a couple um so I didn't know if if you were able to find more people where you are or maybe who knows maybe i'll start up uh or look up for for a, a dutch horror fan facebook group and, and organize yes. something but uh yes. definitely after after this whole thing uh you know settles down with the corona yeah. virus and stuff yeah yeah i see you have the midsommar um poster in the background did you really like that that was my favorite movie of 2019 really nice no yeah, shame for you, it, as you can see. Yeah. What did you what did you really what did what um what did you really like about it? See, that's the thing. I have no idea because usually <laughs> I, I would probably say it's it's way too slow, but for some reason with some movies, it, it, I, I'm like, oh yeah, it's too slow. But with some movies, for some reason, something clicks and I like that it's slow. Mm -hmm. uh, to go back to the Nine uh, book, Dream Spawn. 
that's such a slow paced book and Freddie isn't there until like the 150th page, mm-hmm. but something about it just really attracts me, uh, you know, but overall that's the only movie I think, or I think I saw like the, the last James Bond movie, like Spectre. I saw that one two times in theaters uh, and I saw this one two times in theaters as well. And usually I just see it once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a really, um, I really enjoyed the movie too. And the one thing about it that I really liked is that it, it had the dark elements in the beginning, but the, the whole movie is so colorful and so yeah. bright and everything that happening in it is so awful. <laughs> it just doesn't match up. And that's what makes it so great. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and on one end, you also really don't know what to feel with some, uh, with some uh-huh. scenes. It's like, there's this really, you know, kind of fucked up thing happening, but you're like, should I laugh now? Or should I, yeah. or should I like, what's going on? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it was like an emotion I'd never had before. Yeah. Did you, um, uh, like hereditary, did you see hereditary? Yeah. But did I definitely prefer Midsommar. Slow? Yeah. Midsommar. How about you? I was you? just wondering. Yes. Uh, I saw hereditary once and I haven't watched it since and I've been thinking about it, but like it and Midsommar were so great to watch at the time, but they take a lot of emotional energy out of me when I watch them because they're so intense that it's like, uh oh, there we go. I'm sorry, my computer just freaked out on me for a second. Oh, <laughs> they're so they're so intense that um, it's hard. That to your watch. computer freaked out. Yeah, <laughs> my computer's like, don't talk about it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it is. Do you have you ever watched um, a horror movie that when you were watching it, um, and maybe you can name one off the top of your head, um, that you watch it and you're like, "Wow, this is really great!" While I'm while I'm watching it, but then you're done and you're like, "I don't know if I'll watch that again," or it might be a while until I watch that again because it is so intense. Well, I'm not sure if 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 I had that because it's so intense, but. Um, even just even just emotionally draining like it when you watch it you're like wow this is something else but then you know it doesn't it might not be an easy rewatch probably frank Nooker. oh really uh, no just kidding oh, <laughs> that's like the I last like, movie okay. that would do that <laughs> all right all right okay tell me more <laughs> you'd have to be really sensitive to get emotionally drained from that movie <laughs> no i'm I'm really not sure, but um, a non-horror movie, though, that I thought was really intense and interesting um, was Koyani Squatsi. I don't know if you have heard about that one. No. What it's, is that? It's, it's like an experimental film, uh, and it basically shows that, and it's a movie from the 80s, um, and the message, I mean, I think it was even shot in the 70s. I'm not even sure, but it's um, an experimental documentary. Um, and the director, he was, um, basically his message with that, that film was that we as human beings aren't using technology anymore, but we're living it. And he really showed that throughout that film without words in a brilliant way. Like there's one shot, for example, where there's uh, like this microchip. And you see like all these things in his microchip, you know, and then it fades out, uh, like fades into like the, um, I think the Los Angeles or New York skyline and it just matches up. Um, and you got like, um, you know, these time lapses of people running around and the music, it's like classical music, which I'm not a fan of at all, really. I mean, I don't barely listen to it, but in his movie, it just worked so well because you have these like really fast instruments and you see all these people running and shit and and, you know getting to their work and then you have like slow shots or like shots of people just staring into the camera and it's like really you know kind of confronting because you're Uh like why are they looking at the camera what's their story you know and then (laughs) the the music really slows down just really intense and it completely out of my comfort zone but really good film yeah um have you ever watched any of that and i don't know uh if you have access there have you ever watched any of the black mirror shows? Uh, no i've not because i love technology but 
it is really scary about a lot of the possibilities and, and watching that show is one of the things that when I watch it, I'm like, wow, that's really interesting and, and scary at the same time. But when you finish an episode, you're, you're pretty depressed. And then it, it takes some time to bring, bring yourself to maybe watch the next one, but you, you, um, feel so compelled because the last one was interesting and you're just curious how the events of, of, of the next episode are going to unfold, but it is really, um, it is just one of those things that makes you feel, I guess it's positive while watching it. Maybe you, you have a positive outlook on it. I know for me, I do, but when you're done, it's just not necessarily a happy feeling. <laughs> yeah. So. A movie that did that for me, or at least like maybe depressed, um, was the mist. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know what? I, I read the book. I read the story, but I haven't watched the movie yet. And, and I was getting ready to watch it and someone was like, oh, it's so depressing. And I'm like, oh no, I don't know if I'm ready to watch <laughs> that right now. <laughs> I had no idea that it was depressing. Everyone was talking about like the ending. Oh, the ending. So I was like, what's going to happen? And, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how or if you even know what happens at the end. Or... I don't know what happens in the movie end. Right. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I won't talk about that further, but it was just like, I kind of don't really like that kind of horror because, mm -hmm. you know, um, I can, if I just live my life and, and, you know, then I'll get depressed anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so, you know, I, I kind of want fun movies, you know, uh -huh. um, but, uh, yeah, so it's it's one of those things where I prefer I, I would rather watch Night of the Demons or Return of the Living Dead or something because yes. that kind of gets you out of the shitty world. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it really is, um, horror really is cathartic. I know that as of late with the holidays coming up that, you know, everybody's pretty apart and it makes me very sad. And so I was like, you know, I, I know that when I feel stressed and I watch horror, even though I'm stressed already. And then I watch horror, which also makes me stressed to a certain extent because you might enjoy, we, I mean, we love it, but my heart still pounds. And I'm like, do I really want to watch that? Um, I know last night that I watched a couple of films when I was feeling kind of down. It just made me feel so much better. <laughs> it's, it's, it, is, it is pretty amazing. But sometimes there are certain movies where you're like, oh God, that's why I never watch sad movies. Even though they're supposed to be an inspiring story, no, absolutely not. I would much <laughs> rather watch a romantic comedy than um, some of those movies that are super emotional because I just, I can't. The crying, mm -mm, I'm out. I can't do it. Won't do it. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, to move from the topic of movies to music, I obviously notice your ACDC shirt. Yes. Um, I, I always feel like, uh, horror and metal kind of go hand in hand or like metal uh and hard rock basically mm -hmm. um well you obviously usually i ask the question are you a metal or hard rock fan but <laughs> your your shirt says it all yeah i am a huge acdc fan somebody in the horror twitter twitter world asked yesterday after horror what's your second love and i was like acdc because of course you know stephen king loves them they're one of his favorite bands they did the music to maximum overdrive um, and there really is such an overlap between a lot of what people in the community and the horror community love. They love metal. They love rock. And I, I love it. That's my favorite genre of music. Um, and I always am looking for horror movies that have the music element and then have, have the horror element like Deathgasm or uh, Trick or Treat from the 80s. Um, I know I've been trying to look up Black Roses. And I just haven't, I have to buy it because I can't find it anywhere to stream or rent on, on, on video. Um, so I was going to buy it, but like that, that's one of my favorite genres of horror is metal and music and or music and horror. I love it. Oh yeah. And, and another thing um, that is also uh, really cool was like the late nineties or early two thousands when they released like albums for the movies. Yes. Like Bride of Chucky has like Rob, mm -hmm. uh, like White Zombie, I think. Um, and, you know, even Slayer, Lamb of God. I think Motorhead is even on there. Freddy versus Jason, oh, you know, yeah. Slipknot, Spine Shank. I love Spine that Shank time Mino, too. Yes. Yeah, those, those are fucking awesome. <laughs> yes, there's 
such great songs. I know I have a whole playlist of just like horror metal music. Um, yeah, it's 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 so great. I, I love that. And I love, you know, that Rob Zombie did his horror movies. I know not everybody really likes them, but when he used his music and the different things he put in them, I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, horror and metal slash rock. Um, I, I love them together. It's just the perfect combo. Uh-huh. Yeah. Plus, everyone thinks, you know, horror fans are psychos, and then they think metal fans are, well, psychos too. So <laughs> that goes hand in hand as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Might as well just knock them all out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Who's your favorite? What, what, um, do you have a favorite band or like horror metal song or movie? Motorhead is and uh -huh. will probably always be my favorite metal band. R.I.P. Lemmy. And yeah, nice. I have never seen them live and that's probably gonna be the saddest thought for the rest of my life that I've never seen Motorhead. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be hard. I know um, Led Zeppelin is one of my favorite bands of all time and they are not. I mean, they did the reunion, but it wasn't with, it wasn't with John Bonham. And I know that Robert Plant thinks that they are kind of cursed. And so he will never want to do something. But I'm thankful that I got to see ACDC tour. I never got to see them with Malcolm because when they were touring, um, not this new album, which by the way, when the first song came out, I stayed up for it and I hugged a pillow and I just bawled the entire time because I was so excited to hear their new song because I didn't know that they'd, they would do something else. I figured that they would, but not this year. And to have Brian Johnson back, whom I love very, very much, made me so happy. Um, but I never got to see Malcolm when he was alive because when they were touring the last time that he toured with them, um, I was I was young and my I couldn't afford my own ticket and I was not allowed to go on my own. So oh, that sucks. I never got to see him. So that's one of my big regrets is that I didn't have a chance. I didn't like push. I wasn't like, I don't care. Birthday, Christmas, whatever. Yeah, Just but the, take me to go. You know, in that case, I don't have it that bad because, you know, Lemmy died in 2015 and I was probably still listening to top 40 stuff or something. So, you but know, still, I mean, that that would um that would be that would be really hard i mean you must have been so when did when did you get into motorhead i think i got into metal like two years ago or something um oh wow what sparked that horror, horror. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense <laughs> it was like my first you know alice cooper really got me into like heavier stuff and i i don't know if you're familiar with the film sing street uh yeah I love that movie too. <laughs> um, that one opens up with like, uh, because I'm also a big fan of like 80s pop music. Um, yeah, 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 me too. And um, like, you know, Duran Duran, Spend the Ballet. I, I love that shit. Um, but uh, the movie opens up with Stay Clean by Motorhead. And I thought it was just so cool. And then yeah. I kind of listened to the playlist. And, you know, now I almost have every single album on vinyl. Um, That's awesome. And I just, I, I don't think Lemmy is a real, you know, he's a really great front man, really great musician, mm -hmm. but also just when you watch a lot of interviews and kind of start to understand his way of thinking, really inspirational. I've, I've learned like a lot from interviews with a dead person, basically, Yeah. <laughs> which is just like yeah. crazy. Yeah. I was just watching a documentary a couple months ago about the rainbow room in Los Angeles. And then they had a whole section with Lemmy cause he would go there all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I know there are so many, I just feel like I was born in the wrong time because even though we still have a lot of great things right now, I mean, just to be able to go to a motorhead concert back then or ACDC or, um, to Led Zeppelin or something and to be able to see, you know, a lot of these horror movies when they came out on the big screen and nobody really knew anything about it. I know that there's a, an audio recording that somebody took from the seventies when Halloween came out and everybody's reaction at the time and everybody's screaming. And I just, that would just be so much fun. Cause you don't really get that reaction in theaters anymore other than the Marvel movies when everybody's watching it for the first time oh, and yeah. screaming and clapping. And when scream four came out, I got to see that in theaters um, the night it came out and people were screaming and clapping and that was a great feeling but you don't get that that much anymore and it would have just been really cool to live at the height of of the slasher era in the 80s 
I think that's also like an uh, an American thing, really, because here in Holland, everyone is just silent during a movie. Like it's just, really? yeah, it's just not a thing here at all. I mean, pretty much for us too. It's been only like a like an like a couple of occasions when. I've ever been in a theater when people have been reacting. Either it was just a group of fans watching a movie that they've seen a million times and they were all sitting there talking about it. Or um, or it's like, you know, a, a sequel to an iconic movie that comes out and there are a couple fans in the theater and we're all big fans who are there and then they scream or, or like the Marvel movies when they come out. But other than that, you go to the theater and everyone's like, <laughs> they're just eating their popcorn but I, w- I would have loved to have I, w- I would love to sit through more of that that would have been just so cool even back then um yeah, imagine watching the exorcist in the theaters <laughs> for the first w- time and you have no out. idea what it is oh that would have been so cool yeah yeah and and um here in holland uh, me and my friends once were like you know i really love those audio things like from from you know the premiere in america where everyone's like clapping and, and yelling yeah. that's so cool i wish they did it here and we were like yeah. you know let's just when the marvel logo shows up we're gonna clap and we're gonna see if everyone else is gonna clap with yeah. us so we were like clapping at the marvel logo and, and going like whoa you know just chanting uh-huh. and no one did anything we were just sitting there together and it was like everyone's just looking at us like Can you shut the fuck up <laughs> Yeah, it does. It does make the experience a lot different when people are really into it. It's like going to a concert and everybody's really into it. Sometimes you'll get a great crowd. Sometimes you'll get a dud crowd. Yeah. Um, but it really does add to the experience. I remember watching The Dark Knight in theaters, and at the part where the Joker flips the truck, some lady out front was like, "Oh heck no!" It was just. I just love hearing people react to the movie because it it adds to the experience so much um yeah because usually I wish people do that more often like in in like these really bad sitcoms when they add like uh, laughing sound effects or something you know yeah. that already motivates you sort of to laugh as yeah. well and that's Have you ever like you heard them without the laugh tracks and you like watch it and you go huh that's not really that funny and then they add it back in yeah and then you're like <laughs> it just yeah yeah it, it really adds does something change. yeah Definitely, definitely. The same goes for concerts in the end. I saw Slipknot the beginning of this year, um, which is just wow. like, I, I can't even imagine going to a concert now, especially now there's a big as Slipknot, but um, it was just so normal back in the good old days, basically. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, it was just so cool because everyone was like jumping and, and just pushing each other and was so much fun. Um, but I saw Alice Cooper and it was kind of... I wasn't really up front, but I also wasn't in the back. I was kind of in the middle, like at the point where everyone's just standing. And I was like, come on, he's playing Poison. Fucking jump and dance, man. (laughs) Yeah, some of the concerts, and I really don't like it, is when they have the seats because I want to stand and other people want to sit. And if I stand in front of them, I feel because one time I saw, um, I've seen ZZ Top a couple times, and the last time that I went to see them, it was, it was not like a, like, folding chairs, I mean, it was an auditorium, and they had all the seats there, and everybody was sitting, and I just, like, wanted to get up, but everybody else was sitting, and um, Billy Gibbons was like, you guys having a good time, and everyone was like, yeah, and obviously, we weren't standing up, and then at the very end, he got, and we all stood up at the very end, and he goes, now you're having a good time, and you know, it's like all these bands, they're so used to having people jump and really enjoy whatever they're doing, but a lot of times now when people have the seats, they just sit down. It's so weird to me because it's just not the same experience. I mean, yeah. I, first time I saw ACDC was in 2015 and I was so nervous that I was going to be blocked by some big tall guy that I bought seats in the, on the, op, like on the side of the auditorium. So they, they had seats there. Cause I thought that would be the only way that I would not have an obstructed view, but it was funny because I really, this is one of my big regrets in life is um, more so than not seeing them when Malcolm was around was not getting that floor seat ticket because nobody, I would have been there when the doors opened, I would have gone straight to the front. 
And I was so mad at myself. But then when I went to see him when they had Axel and I had already bought tickets from beforehand and they had to reschedule, they had the seats on the ground and people would stand up and then they'd sit down. And I was like, (laughs) can't take it. Can't take it. But it is what it is. It does. It does matter um, what the energy of the room is like. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I also feel like it depends on the musician, though. Yeah. Because, um, you know, with, uh, with like a rock or a metal show, you should definitely be standing, you know, mm-hmm. um, or at least I think so. Um, yeah. but I saw John Carpenter live and, you know, he's, he's just doing the Halloween theme song. You're not gonna dance or jump to that or anything. Yeah. He's gonna, you know, kind of yeah. enjoy the music basically. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. That's so cool that you got to see him. I have not had a chance to see him. So I know some people who have, and that was great. I hope, I mean, I know he wants to get back to touring, um, like when this settles, but next time he's here, I'm going to do like a meet and greet ticket for sure. Oh, that's cool. Because I didn't last time. And that's just another thing where I'm like, I should have done that, but next time, hopefully. Yeah. Do you think that, are you a musician? Um, No. I, I, I mean, I have made like uh, one like sort of theme song, kind of John Carpenter-ish. It's more of like a demo now, but I'm, I'm like kind of wanting to, you know, really do something with that because uh, I want to kind of want to get back to making like short horror movies um, mm-hmm. and then now compose my own music yeah, as well, so you basically. You'll be like your own John Carpenter. You'll make the movie and then you'll also make the music. Yeah. That's that was yeah. the thing with my when I used to make movies with like my brother and friends. It was like directed by Roger, uh, actor Roger, <laughs> produced <laughs> Roger, writer, writer Roger, <laughs> editor Roger. But I, I feel like um, if if you're making uh, movies with friends and your brother, and it's like you know basically your movie, it should be your movie, and you should really do everything. You know? Yeah. Except yeah. for maybe some acting, but yeah, and it saves you money because a lot of times if you don't know somebody that does it, you know, yeah. you kind of got to be a jack of all trades. Exactly. Yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But who knows? Maybe maybe I'll be the next uh, John Carpenter someday. <laughs> don't forget about me when you are. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Good. Good. So, um, is there anything you would like to add to the uh, episode? Um. Just that uh, we've been working, myself and friends have been working on a documentary called Fred Heads about the fandom of A Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, Almost done with editing, getting ready to do the marketing push for its release. Um, And then just getting back to my podcasts, The Horrorpreneur, and then trying to do more Elm Street content once we kind of get out of this Fred Heads thing um, so that we can can focus on that again, because I really, really enjoy doing that. So... Other than that, just um, just hanging out around Instagram and Twitter and TikTok. So it's been fun. Really, really appreciate you having me on the show, Roger. You're so welcome. Um, are there any links um, you want me to put in the description? Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, I can. I can send you some. I'll send you. I could do my um, Instagram one, and then we'll do the Fred Heads one because that's coming up. Fantastic. So. Um, Whoever's watching, all of that will be in the description. Um, you definitely should check it out. It's a great account. And I'm definitely going to do my research for the Fred Hats documentary because that sounds really interesting. Um, and yeah, I guess that about sums up the interview. Thanks for having me. You're so welcome. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching and uh, we'll see you guys next time. See ya. You're pissing me off, Roger. It's gonna be wild.